And how can we do City View Detroit and not have the people who are in charge of the city of Detroit? I bring to you the Deputy Mayor, Mr. Todd Bettison. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you, Andre, for having me here. Um, this is, you, you picked a wonderful day, a wonderful location, and many folks don't even know that Detroit sits on, to, on an international border. So you, right in our backdrop is the beautiful Detroit River, and right across the way is Windsor, Canada. And so one of the unique facts is that this is the only point where Canada is south to the United States. So you're looking at something unique here. So if you're ever on Jeopardy or one of those shows, at what point is Canada south of the United States, Detroit, Michigan, and is Windsor? Just a little fun fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got a house where it's like a, cr I'm on, you go down the river, I guess it loops around. Right, right. My, my Michigan house is further down mm -hmm. on the river. Yes. And it's like pointing at Canada. Yes. But not this side. Yes, yes. And so, you know, the beautiful city of Detroit highlighting it. And um, just for the other folks out there, you know, I know you have an international audience right here, but I just want to kick this out that the city of Detroit's river walk has been voted by Time magazine. Um, it has been voted as the number one river walk in the country. And so, um, you know, that was actually surprising to me as well. You know, when you think about everywhere else, you think about Los Angeles, California, you think San about- San Antonio other, has San, a nice river walk. Yeah, yeah, we beat them. The, the D, the D, <laughs> Detroit versus everybody. They got them shirts for real. They actually wear them here. Yeah, yeah. Detroit versus everybody. <laughs> yes, but um, we have you here. Um, not only are you a phenomenal, I'm saying, politician and leader, you're born and raised in Detroit. You yeah, come from yeah, this. I always yeah. say to people, we say, oh, we can't get out of the hood. We can't make it. But you can't. What part of Detroit you come from? So um, let me let me let me do a, a, a clarifier. I was definitely made and um, spent a lot of time in Detroit. I moved to Detroit when I was 17. OK. And so my mother, um, she came off to Wayne State University. She um, she got pregnant with me, um, had me, you know, like so many mothers, single mothers, took me back to live with my grandparents in Benton Harbor. And for folks who don't know about Benton Harbor, it's in Michigan on the other side of the state. But if you Google it, definitely 90% um, African-American, one of the roughest spots, most violent spots. I mean, and there's nothing that we celebrate, but it's just when we talk about poverty. It's a tough whenever, city. Whenever you find poverty, crime is synonymous, um, di diminished services are synonymous. So really the root cause of everything that we have to deal with and address is poverty and opportunity. We've had a discussion. Absolutely. <laughs> I like to <the> grow. <laughs> just for facts, just because it's y'all, right? We had a discussion probably six months ago. Absolutely. And it was like, hey, I want to do a gun initiative. And you want to do this massive gun initiative. And I was like, not exactly. Right. The initiative has to be poverty, of which guns roll under. And to see you embrace it six months later, I'm like, that's my guy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, with um, Mayor Duggan, with... Um, our city council, with the money that we get in with our ARPA, we invest and we're investing in the people of Detroit. Um, we just had a major announcement about about a month ago where we're taking 200 million of ARPA dollars and we're putting it into rental assistance, you know, um, um, making sure that folks are able to have affordable housing. And so just a lot of initiatives to make sure that, because we know that that's an issue, um, regardless of where you are, and one of our major focuses too as, as the city is um, going through a renaissance that everybody has opportunities and that our Detroiters are not displaced. So we're gonna make sure that it's inclusive for all and that everybody has an opportunity in Detroit. So it, this is the spot to be. One of the, one of the first things we did when we met, you introduced me to your ceasefire team. Yes. Which is a group of gentlemen and ladies who do community outreach with gangs and violence and guns and you oversaw them, um, it was under your preview. And he was like, Drake, come on, let's go. <laughs> and you put me in the room with your, with your ceasefire team. And we're going to interview them while we're in Detroit as well. But what made you want to put together a team of people, ex-offenders included, to go out and do this work of helping people? So um, yeah, I retired from the police department after 27 years. And one thing that I know is we can't arrest our way out of crime. We just can't. Um, it's always new people standing there waiting to be arrested. So we have to really deal with the root cause of it, right? And so um, we always hear the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it's often referred to as soldiers. But in 
urban environments in the hood, we got folks experiencing, I won't even say PTSD, but th that's on the table, but continuous exposure to stress and trauma. And so you have to have the wraparound services. You have to have stuff to disrupt that, to be able to kill that. You always hear about hurt people, hurt people. Definitely. And so, you know, in order to get people to stop hurting people, we have to get them the therapy. We have to get them the resources. And it's not just that person. It's a family approach. You have to wrap around the children and their whole family connected them to jobs. So we have to build the whole house up because if I only have that child for a few, or, or have a person for a few moments, you know, a couple hours out the day, et cetera, but they're going right back into that environment. We have to deal with the environment. I got to give you this. This is my consulting hat. And what you just said was just boom. What I heard, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You said, no, it's continued I, I came because it post-traumatic, continued traumatic stress disorder. Right. No, no. I am going to call my assistant <laughs> at the end of this interview and say, go buy CTSD, and I am going to create a whole movement around continual trauma. Post-traumatic. You can't. Even say, it doesn't come off the head right. Post-traumatic tra stress disorder, continual traumatic stress disorder. Absolutely. Oh no, no. Listen, listen. I heard that, and listen. I heard that. That you can. Ten years from now, that'll be the thing in the country. Yes. Continual traumatic stress disorder, not post, because we're in it. We're in it. We're in it. Post is when you came home from war. Oh, right. We're in it. So continual traumatic stress disorder yes. It's going to be a thing created here. I got the concept from you, but I'm going to go birth it and grow it. Please do, because oh. for me, listen, I heard a leader say that we could get so much more done if you don't worry about who get the credit. And so when we solve and address the problems, we all win. Yeah. I'm on a winning team. The, you know, the, the draft is coming, 2024. Ooh I'm ready. NFL draft in Detroit. <laughs> and, and we got the big countdown right in the city of Detroit, counting backwards to the day. So we're looking the, forward the to The President of the United States is here today. Yes. Yes. I came, we was driving around yesterday. All the streets are shut down. They got helicopters. And I'm like, what's going on? You're like, well, the president's here. Yep. And both days that he's been here, you've been with us. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's a time and place. I've had the opportunity to meet the president before, but you know, I'm a servant and so it's not about me. It's about always constantly looking to move um, um, the agenda forward. And I'm talking about the agenda for the people of the city of Detroit. And so, you know, we know that poverty, we know that violence, we know, but in particular, like talking to Andre, making sure that folks are connected to the services and that our small business, um, um, black Detroiters and you know folks of color, because the, the majority and the big businesses, they can take care of themselves. They do a great job of it. But who needs access to the mayor's office in particular um, is small businesses. And Detroit, for those who don't know, is um, roughly an 80% African-American city, um, very proud, hardworking, smart, intelligent people and we're changing the whole narrative from being the old Rust Belt manufacturing. Detroit is becoming a tech town. It's all about tech. And we got some entrepreneurs, our young people, they don't just want a job, you know, and there's jobs available, but what they want is training, opportunity, and access. One of the things that was cool for me, I want, I, I always, I do this not because I can just go sit in the cut and count my money and just watch TV. You know what I'm saying? If I want to see folks, I watch them on TV. Right, right. I ain't gonna go near, I ain't gonna go near nobody. Right. I gotta sit in my house and just chill <laughs> and just watch my son grow up. But um, I come out because I have to set a standard. Yes. I have to blaze a path that when they see people see me, they see the group of people who are watching this on their tablets and saying, well, if this guy came from prison and he had this institutional record mm -hmm. along with a street criminal record and he mm -hmm. can turn it around, they, I can produce value. People like value. So when somebody comes from a given city or place, everybody rushes there to see if there's some more. Right. When they found oil, I mean, I mean, was it diamonds and gold? Wherever they find diamonds, people rush there. When they found gold in California, it was a gold rush. Yes. Everybody rushed to get more gold. So if I can be that gold coming out of prison, I want the world to rush into prison and look for more gold. That's right. Because it's there. It's there and it's initially cheap. You get to buy it cheap in the beginning. I'm going to tell you, I ain't cheap no more. I'm, yesterday's price is not today's price. But when you first, when they first got me, I was $40,000 for the year. Mm. 
you can't get me $40,000 for a week now. Mm. But when, you, when I first came out, 40 G's for the year was a, a phenomenal amount of money. It was crazy. I got 40,000 a year. Right. Now people call me, I'm like, yo, uh, I ain't right. got time for that. Right. <laughs> but so the people who need to hire and engage, if they say that's gold, where did it come from? I want I want a gold rush going into the prisons because there's so many diamonds. They're going to go looking for gold and come out with diamonds. We we know that. We say that. We we hear that and, and oftentimes some of our most creative people, I mean, really in law enforcement and just in conversations that I have with folks, they said if the persons that are sitting behind bars had used that creativity you know in a legitimate business setting because you, let's face it some of the guys that you were in with were running multi-million dollar corporations and what? had the corporate structure there and i know you know you you was one of them you know i wasn't multi-millionaire uh, I, I was uh, hustling <laughs> i wasn't multi i would keep it honey. right we were talking about your first since you become deputy mayor you going to the mayor as me being your first hire like you want to go to you've been asking me to come meet with you with the mayor so you can present me to the mayor to say this is a guy I want to hire absolutely and for folks watching this I mean I don't have he has a suit on I have to go get my blazers out I want my blazer the other day yeah yeah <laughs> but um to go from sitting inside being not part of the city to going to a whole nother city and becoming an advisor to deputy mayors is, is how does that work it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, and I, I'm a God-fearing person and definitely believe in divine intervention in meeting folks. And so when the Spirit moves me, um, when I met you, it was like, okay, this guy's special, different. I didn't even know, but I just knew after listening to the conversation and I wanted more. And then from there, I took action. It's like, hey, you know what? Let's put you to the test. Follow me right now. We had one meeting and I put him to work the same day. I introduced him to my ceasefire team. I put him before the guys and I watched him because if somebody can tell you what they do, I want to see it in action. And so, Dre, you definitely- um, I body slammed the room. Absolutely, he did. <laughs> body he, slammed the room. He absolutely did. And then after two sessions, he had raised the standard um, in the performance level of my ceasefire crew and they were thinking different, moving different. And just the, the short period of time that you've been working with them, I got a whole new reform ceasefire team. They're far more efficient, effective, um, and, 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 and always looking for higher ground because that's what we have to do. You know, being satisfied today and taking it to the next level of service, the next level of service. And I know in Lean Six Sigma, they use the word continuous improvement. That's what we're always doing. But when the mayor brought me on as deputy mayor and he was saying, hey, I want you to come be deputy mayor. And he said, um, when you take the role, you're gonna always have to find new talent. Always be searching for new talent, that talent, because the book that you gave me, which I got, is not how, but who. And so with the new talent and the who, that's how we'll be able to get stuff done and go to that higher level. And so my brother, you're the who. I learned discipline by taking a culinary class. Okay. Culinary taught me I had to follow the instructions to bake i'm a baker i can't bake a cake being cool after baking cake by the instructions if i want the results i have to follow the instructions right. um baking taught me discipline okay you know what i'm saying and a taught me compassion coaching basketball i had a bunch of young knuckleheads i had to call them knuckleheads young high energy people yeah you know i'm saying who didn't listen far got in trouble i got my whole team with people suspended from the league we have basketball leagues this guy get kicked out for fighting he gets kicked out for cuts out the ref mm -hmm. my whole team was that the renegades. Okay. They were the best of the best, but they're all renegades. They taught me patience. I learned all my skills multiple different ways. I learned how to answer a phone at a job that had nothing to do with me answering phones. Good afternoon. How may I help you? Oh, he's not available right now. I might take a message. And I learned accounting. I learned bookkeeping. I learned leadership. I learned interviewing. While I was on these other jobs, I got skill sets. Yes. And that's all I sit here with is a GED and skill sets versus people who apply for the same job with PhDs and masters, but don't have the skill sets. Skill yeah. sets win. It, skill sets win and being able to learn from just life, right? And so every time I've ever had a setback in life or, you know, something that didn't go right, or even if it was a mistake, you know what I would term that mistake as? Tuition. 
<laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, I will never, I learned a lesson. And it was a, a lesson, and just like when you go to college, you, you do whatever you do, you have to pay somebody for that lesson, right? And so these lessons that you've learned, you know, that's just tuition that you paid and is self-taught. It is something about that, by experiencing it, where it sticks. And you're able to not only have it from a book sense, but an ap application sense. So I see you applying the knowledge that you have to a high level, and you become a master at it. I live my life in a way where I can stand before a deputy mayor, a mayor, a judge, a governor, and make a plea for my brother and say, listen, over the last 22 years of my life, I've worked in the streets of America and 24 other countries surrounding us, helping increase productivity in people and decrease violence and saving lives in the process. I've worked on drug addiction, I've worked with murders, I've worked with child soldiers, I've worked with cartels, all in attempts of retooling the thinking and the way they approach the world. Because that approach dictates life or death in many instances. And I've been able to share and grow many of people in many situations. And I'm now currently working in the city of Detroit, helping its renaissance. And I stand before you today, Your Honor, asking that this man before you be given an opportunity, not at freedom, but a chance to make this country better.